Everything's okay. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very honoured to be to be asked back. When I gave the talk a couple of years ago, I thought that's it. I'll never be asked to re return. So I'm thrilled to I'm thrilled to be back. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, I predicted back then. I remember in second home, I said, "Look at him now. He's cheap for a signature. He'll be on the stage <laughs> any day now." And I was right. It was great. Well, should we should we should we start with the Harry Styles? Is it true? Guys, uh, what can I say? Um, lots of rumours, lots of speculation. Um, my experience of that whole process was that, like with most jobs, there, there's an there's a audition process that takes days or weeks or months. In this case, it was over the course of six or even nine months. It was the longest process I've ever been part of. Lots of rumours were swirling around that Mr. Styles of One Direction was in the frame. I don't know. I honestly don't know if that's true. If it is true and he said no, then I can only thank him. This is a shout out to Harry Styles. If he did say no, then you paved the way for me. So thank you, Harry. I'm, I'm sure you'll share a role or a girlfriend or something along the way in future. <laughs> so, you know. I think that's great. And there's no way he would have turned that down. You just beat him to it. Maybe once you're on set, you can ask the director. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, but I, I, either way, you know, I'm just very happy and feel very lucky and thrilled to be doing it. Before we, before we lose the Disney track and we go back a little earlier to your childhood and getting into acting, you said six, nine months. What was that process like? Was it like, give us a little insight into what it's like to audition successfully for a Disney movie? Yeah. So, um, pretty much on any job you, uh, you, you start out with a script or some sides, which is what they call uh, the scenes, basically, that you're sent to learn. And nowadays, um, a lot of auditions are happening over self-tape, which is you kind of do something like this. You, you film yourself at home with a friend or a colleague and you record a scene um, in the comfort of your own home. And I think that's kind of initially how they separate the wheat from the chaff, I guess. And then usually once you've done that once, you get asked to come into the room. But for this, I think I did three or maybe four self tapes. I was then finally asked to come in to, uh, to meet the director and actually be in the room with him. And of course, the day I went, I completely lost my voice. So it was very Ariel-esque. It felt kind of very pertinent and, and could barely speak, let alone sing, which was a big part of the process. Um, so anyway, I met Rob Marshall, who's the director, who's a brilliant director. Um, and he was lovely because I think the, the thing with auditions is that they're very nerve wracking. And uh, I certainly feel very apprehensive before all of them. But he made me feel very comfortable and he kept saying, this is a workshop. Don't think of it as an audition. You know, it's time to um, it's a time to just explore it and have fun with it. And it really put me at ease, which I think any actor will know is it's key because you can do all the preparation in the world, but sometimes it goes out the window when you get into the room. Um, so it, it kind of went from there. And I guess we did three, we met three times. And the final time I, uh, I read with Hallie, who is playing Ariel and we did some scenes together and again it was on a, on a level and a scale that i was not used to and had never experienced before they usually an audition is just a little video camera and this was a whole crew and a set that they had built just for the audition so it was insane and i think i definitely got a sense of disney and what it means to be part of a disney film just from those early auditions do you get nervous in those moments and like how do you deal with those nerves yeah absolutely i think you know, on the one hand, I, I try and embrace them. I think nerves are healthy for whatever you're doing. Um, I think there's an, you can try and use them and it, it offers, uh, it keeps you focused and, and the adrenaline can be, can be helpful to really perform your best. Um, but I think deep, deep breathing, that's always the way. I, I always kind of try and stay calm through, in through the nose, out through the mouth and uh, hope for the best. That's kind of the way it goes. Is there, is there a sense of imposter syndrome? I mean, you, you, you've been in lots of very successful shows and programs. Disney's obviously a, 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 on a grander scale. Do you get a sense yeah. of that? Yeah, abs absolutely. Imposter syndrome is, is exactly the two words I always use. I think, um, you know, as whatever career you're doing, 
usually as, as you go through it and you start to progress um, and take little steps, you start to feel uh, like you shouldn't be there and that you're completely out of your depth, which uh, I think is fine. And I think it's healthy because that's how you learn and that's how you grow as, you know, as a person and certainly grow uh, as an actor, you, you, you know, feeling nervous, feeling out of your depth, I think is a healthy thing because you, you learn from it. So I think if, if you were uh, finding it all very easy and comfortable, I think that that would be, uh, you know, I think that might be an issue. So it's worth saying the average kid listening to this is about 10 or 11 probably. Uh, and I would, I would echo what you just said, which is that that imposter syndrome, that feeling of maybe not being enough or like, why am I here? It doesn't go away. It doesn't matter if you're a professional footballer or an actor, a musician, a business person, whatever. There's no, there's no real difference there. So I think it's really good advice. Yeah, absolutely. It's always there. As Henry said, the, the average age of listeners is about 11. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go back to the beginning then. Uh, what were your school reports like at 11? Did they predict a future Disney star? Were you a swat? Did you, did you miss lessons? How was, what was your sort of schooling like and, uh, and, and how I, did you do acting? I would describe it as middle of the road. I would definitely, there were no predictions and there was no one thinking that I would even possibly go down this route. Um, I always had an interest in acting and always loved it. Uh, but I guess there were just, um, there were other things I was interested in and I, I definitely wasn't the main man when it came to being uh, cast in the school plays. I was kind of the spear carrier, you know, guard six and that kind of thing. And then it was only when uh, I was about 15, 16 years old, where um, at my school, there was something called an independent play, which was a production that was put on by uh, by the students, either written by the students or not, but either way, it was very much run and organized by them. And someone I know uh, wrote a play and we took it up to the Edinburgh Fringe, which for people who don't know is a, a month long festival, theatre festival in Edinburgh in August. And it celebrates comedy and fringe theatre and it's a really good place for uh, any young actors or anyone really to, to start their careers. Um, and so I went up there as a 16 year old and had an experience of performing for two weeks um, for the first time. And uh, I think just loved the process of A, um, being part of a company and, and for that long as well. Um, I don't think I'd ever done a play for more than two or three days. And uh, two weeks just really gave me a chance to bed in and, and as I say, feel part of the company. And that's what initially I found very exciting. I, I felt very much part of a group, um, which was wonderful. And it, and it sort of built from there. So then in my last couple of years of school, um, I, had, I actually had a knee injury, which kept me off uh, d doing any sport. And so I guess I channeled a lot of a lot more time and energy into, into acting and, uh, and yeah, and it, I guess it went from there. And then we you got a couple of nice comments on here. Rupert says, you really can't get much better than Jonah. This is epic. And Teddy says, how on earth do you reflect on the first moment when you win a part? Was there like a light bulb moment when you thought someone's trusted me to do this professionally? This is it. I'm yeah, like definitely. Because the problem is, is that, you know, again, when you're on an audition process, it's all about the end goal of getting the job. That's the final goal. And then when that eventually happens, which, you know, a comes as a huge surprise it's so you realize oh god i actually have to do the job now and i'm going to be terrible and horrendous and all i've been thinking about is getting this job and now i actually have to prepare for it and try and be not try not be terrible so it's very very frightening we've got josh there he is yes a late minute substitute from the bench for Prince Charles. hello <laughs> yes we have josh and margo Hi, Margo. I'll leave you to it. I love it. Margo's there like... Um, hi, everyone. Sorry. Hey, friend. <laughs> hi, Josh. How's it going? Good. How are you? Uh, good. Josh, we, I'm, you're I'm, very kind for joining us. Thank you. We weren't sure whether you were on a Skype call with Olivia Coleman or the real queen or, <laughs> or, Adrian, or a big uh, or whatever it was. Thank you for coming <laughs> to one side for Oppen and Talks. We've got some very grateful kids, so thank you. Uh, good. I'm glad to be here. So I'm going to give you some context, Josh, because you've just come on Topper and Talks. This is the show for, for kids. It's all about, you know, engaging content. 
for any of you who haven't seen Josh on TV, you will have all have done, of course, because you've just been watching The Crown. Um, Josh is he's an award-winning actor. Uh, he's a star of The Crown, as I said, as a young Prince Charles. He played Larry in the Durrells. He's Johnny Sachs being God's Own Country, which won a, uh, an award, I think. Uh, he's, an, he's another superstar. These guys are best friends. I'm, I'm, I'm one of four, well, amongst us, not the actor. Um, how do you guys know each other? How did you get into acting? How do you, I don't know. How, yeah. Well, I know Josh because we did a short film together when I was 18. So Josh must have been about 40. Um, no, not actually, not really. He's not that old. He's not that old. Um, I was, yeah, I was about 18 and Josh was a little older and uh, we met and became close friends and that developed over the next few years. And then in a very lovely fairy tale way, um, Josh and my sister uh, were introduced by me and uh, they said that I set them up, which is not true. I didn't, I just introduced them. Um, I had no part to play in that, but then they are now together and you were lucky enough to catch her face just at the beginning. That was her there. That was her. Um, yeah, Jonah was, yeah, Jonah was like, like a 18 year old wide eyed kid. Um, very sweet, very enthusiastic. And, um, and I guess, yeah, I was sort of, I don't know, I mean, I wasn't, you know, I was fairly young myself, but um, at the time, I guess I'd been—I <laughs> guess I'd been to drama school and I'd left, and I must have been like 23, 24. So, yeah. Right, so, so Josh, before you arrived, we asked Jonah a little bit about that audition process for the Disney movie and like how that is. You've obviously been in a lot of stuff in recent years, and this has been a progression for both of you. Hmm. The Crown, though, we've got to start with that. They spent a hundred million on the first series of that alone. You're now. Prince Charles, hugely important role as the son of Olivia Coleman. What was that process like getting involved in the show in the first place and how was it? It was a funny one. I think um, not, not traditional in many ways because it was sort of, I was out in Belgium filming something else and I, um, I think I heard from a couple of, a friend, so Vanessa Kirby who plays Princess Margaret is a, an old friend of mine and she'd said, I was, I'd heard they were doing a se season three and I really liked the show and I said, uh, I can't, I texted her, I think, saying I can't wait to see season three. And she said, oh, I'm not doing it, which is kind of confusing. And then she explained that they were recasting everyone because they were jumping forward. At which point, and you can't really see it because I've got um, a beard and hair, but basically I've got quite big ears. And at that point, I just thought, well, it's a no brainer. Surely they'll want to talk to me about it uh, for Prince Charles, obviously. So I and you were right. I mean, I that's right. kind of you know. <laughs> right. um, finally the ears have paid off. So I, I think I can't. I think th they sort of we had a chat. I went in, and spoke to them, and it was the nicest thing ever because we. I sort of knew everyone involved, and um, I'd done a bit of work by that stage. You know, at that stage, and so um, I guess as you go through your career and you know, you, those meetings feel less kind of high pressure in it's only because, it, you know, it's in the early days, it's sort of you're going in, you, you have, you're fighting for everything and no, no one knows who you are. It's, you've got nothing to lose in some ways, but it, they're very high pressured things. Whereas as you get, I guess you've got a bit more experience and they know you and it feels you have a bit more confidence to go in and say, well, you know, I'm doing, this is what I do with the part. If you, if you, if you want me to do it, then that's what you're going to get. And if you don't, that's also fine. So it's much more relaxed. Can I ask a, a question for both of you? Maybe you can answer it in your own way, each as concisely as you can. We've got kids out there who'd love to act and, and, the, and the glamour and the, the highlights are obvious, but what's been the toughest thing for each of you and, and what's your advice to kind of approach that as a young actor? Uh... <sighs> I think, I think, you know, the, the obvious one which people talk about a lot is um, the acceptance that very often, if not more often than not, you will be told no. Um, and it's finding, I think what's difficult is finding a really healthy balance between uh, realism and, 
and then self-belief because you have to have enough self-belief to keep going because the 99.9 percent of the actors myself and josh included are told no from the outset and continue to be told no the whole way through um and i think over time you get used to that and you i think suppose adapt to it and, and gain a thicker skin um but it's certainly something that that doesn't you don't learn overnight um and it's definitely something that you have to come to terms with over a period of time um but it, i think it's it's a, it's a lesson that i think is is helpful and healthy for life in general that things don't always go your way and, and that's okay and it's actually how you adapt and um and respond to that that's that's more important i guess good advice josh yeah yeah i would i would echo that i think um i think i do, i remember sort of first two or three auditions out of drama school i mean it goes right back to when i was auditioning for drama school and hearing like contemporaries of mine being like you know you'd you'd apply to i don't know 10 drama schools and then you wouldn't get in any or you know you might take you three years to get into one and that does that would say nothing about there was a guy in my year who i still stand stand by as one of the greatest actors i've ever worked with um and i love him and he does lots of theater and he's always around he's a terrific actor and i think it took him four years to get into drama school and hands down, one of the most talented actors I've ever witnessed. And so, you know, it doesn't say anything. I mean, you know, there's like, I remember the first few auditions out of drama school and, and missing out, but not even just missing out, but you know, like last two, getting down to the last two, I was like, I wasn't even considered. <laughs> and probably because I wasn't right for it, or there's so many reasons why you're not cast. And it's usually, more often than not, it's actually nothing to do with your talent or your ability. And it's kind of things that are out of your control, like your hair color or um, your so, physique. So forgetting the luck, what is it that makes a good actor? Um, oh. The hospital passed that one, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it is, well, I, sp I suppose it's a very difficult question to answer, I'd say the best way to answer it is just looking at actors that I admire and what they seem to do. And um, I'm very interested, and I know Josh is as well, in actors who um, A, tell a vast, um, like a, a, lots of different types of stories. And then of course, are also, uh, I think, seem the most, um, not necessarily transformative, but seem the most kind of sensitively and empathetically engaged with their characters and just people who, they don't even have to be fully, you know, transformative to be a, a good performance, but you just, you, you really can always sense when someone is really connected with someone else and has really stepped into their shoes, however similar they may be to that person or not. Um, but it's a very difficult thing, I think, to articulate and sometimes it's just like instinctive um what works or not i think if i knew exactly what made a good actor i would be way better than i was <laughs> <laughs> i do think i think the other thing that's quite um i think being a like i don't think it's coincidence that it's hard to articulate what makes a good actor i think ultimately looking back on someone's career it's you know it's actually it's very hard to judge a kind of i think there are the point is that there are so many incredible actors and actually there are probably more in incredible uh, out of work actors than there are incredible in work actors. So there's, you know, like there's a great story we were told at drama school of my favorite actor of all time, which is Pete Postlethwaite. And he, he went like 30 years something um, without like a, uh, a kind of big job. You know, he was like, you know, it's a different system then, but he was, he was stage hands in like theater companies and worked his way up and worked his way up. And it was only in his like, 40s and 50s that he became this kind of great act you know but the point being that he you know he was always a great actor it was just then that he got his chance to kind of show very it. underrated movie of his the town i don't know if ah. you've seen ben affleck he's a really awesome baddie it's a good one not very josh josh can i ask there's, there's lots of um lots of comments coming in from kids asking about the crown can you uh, we're gonna we're gonna play a stupid game in a second our version of mr and mr so we're gonna 
pit you against each other. But can you take us through the process of researching for a role like the one you played? Is it a process that takes a long time? How does that work? Um, it's a process that can take as long as you, uh, as long as time allows, as long as you want and can, uh, are able to give it. I think the best, the best example is that I always think that it's, um, it's sort of, you know, in an ideal world, there's a good, you know, P, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, sorry, in, in his kind of, um, later work, used to do a film every two, three years, I think. And he would describe it as um, a sportsman, they warm up and then they warm down at the end of their exercise. And if you sit, I always think that if you see it as in an ideal world, and this is not the case for Jonah or I right now, hopefully one day it will be, but in an ideal world, I'd like to think that you'd have sort of two or three months minimum in the lead up to a role and then two or three months minimum on the other side of a role so that you can kind of uh, debrief I guess and sort of warm down and the two the two but the two months two or three months before role is the most exciting so be it research or like I mean in, in the crown sense there's so there's a lot of emphasis on the voice and trying to find little details that feel like you are you know representing a real person but actually the hardest thing in in the crown was doing all that work and making sure that you know, like when I come out of a car, I'm like touching my cufflinks like Prince Charles does and touching his pocket thing and doing like a weird thing with his mouth. And like, you know, all those little details are great, but actually the hardest thing is then getting rid of those and being like, you know, this is a character, I'm an actor and my job is to create a character rather than do an impersonation of a real person. And, and the hardest thing was then taking away all that and going, okay, now let's do something that, you know, do the fun bit. So it took, yeah, two or three months at the moment, but ideally it could be endless, it could take years. Okay, and um, I'm not an actor and I, I have certain frustrations with acting as I'm sure you, you both do. Can I ask, what are the frustrations that you see on a day-to-day -day basis that perhaps give it a, a bad name in certain circumstances? Is there anything that actors do which you think, oh, for God's sake, stop doing that? Oh, plenty, plenty. Um, I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one. A acting is, uh, it's a really funny industry and profession because um, it's very extreme. Um, and on the one hand, many people who are involved, um, and like we've said, Josh and I both have gone through this and I'm sure will at some point again of, you know, you're not working and it's very difficult to break in. And it feels like maybe at times, it's this impenetrable, very difficult, scary thing. But then the, the, at the opposite end of the spectrum, you have people who are very much um, in demand. And at times, I think, you know, there are various reasons for this, but at times that gives them an, you know, an elevated sense of self. And I think what's important with acting and I suppose with any kind of writing, directing, anything in the arts, again, it's finding that balance between being um, proud and excited about what you do. And certainly I think that acting and, and art and in, in all its forms is you know, integral to our society. But I think also, you know, if you think about everything that's happening at the moment, I think you also have to have some perspective about the things that actually make the world go round and the kinds of jobs and the kind of industries that are, you know, um, really genuinely integral and fundamental to a society's function. Um, so on the one hand, you know, I, I don't necessarily think it's like, oh, you know, what I do doesn't matter. Um, but at the same time, people who give acting or, or, or film a kind of, uh, as I say, an elevated thing above anything else, it drives me crazy because it's, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's not how it should be. Yeah. <laughs> We both have a weird thing about <laughs> a secret thing, which is now about to be not secret. We both have a thing about actors reading poetry on their social media pages, which we- There we go. That's the nitty gritty that I wanted to yeah, hear. <laughs> sorry. Basically, that's our kind of two-faced side, which is, um, it's fine. Oh, Look, yeah. I don't know why we have an issue with it. Poetry's beautiful. And if anyone's going to read it, it should be actors. But 
it just I just wish they'd keep it off their social media. <laughs> yeah, keep it keep it more ethereal than that. I agree. Yeah. I think we should do a very quick, very quick quick fire round, because we've got kids out there with melting biscuits and probably fish <laughs> to get to, and we've stolen too much of your time already. Oh. So what do we think, Walter? I reckon a very speedy quick fire where you have to answer one word each, perhaps for the other person. How about that? Exactly. Okay. So I've this, never played this game. Oh, it's, it's it's what it's what they do on hen parties, you know, Mr. and Mrs., where they have to ask, you know, answer for the other person. So we're going to see how well Jonah knows Josh and vice versa. Okay. So Great. We'll yeah. ask Jonah first about Josh, and it's literally one word each. So we'll snap you, you, and then next question, you, you, next. Question. Okay. 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 So, uh, Jonah, let's start. In ten years' time, Josh will be playing. Uh, Juliet. Do I do Jonah? In Romeo and Juliet, that is, yeah. Okay, and uh, Josh, in 10 years' time, Jonah will be playing... Garface. Is that cool? Okay. I think that's Josh. really nice of me. Okay, Jonah, Josh's most annoying habit is... <laughs> <laughs> that. That's not a word, but he loves, he loves twiddling his hair. It's not really annoying, but it's the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> Says a thousand words. And, uh, um, uh, his diet. <laughs> okay. Uh, Final uh, one. You go ahead. No, you go ahead. You go. Okay. Uh, his dream role. Josh's dream role that he would love to play. Um. Uh, Lucian Freud. Um, Jonah's is, <laughs> oh God, um, I don't know, Jonah, I think something, um, maybe like a really, I, this is not one word, is it? Um, you can get, Hamlet. You can... Oh, I it. I it was going to be Hamlet or James Bond, I wasn't sure yeah. which. We actually yeah. had a question from Seb earlier asking which of you is going to be picking up the James Bond mantle very soon? Ooh. No, no. I'd probably, uh, well, probably neither. But um, I think whoever, whoever plays Bond, the other one of us will play Money Penny in a kind of, yeah. I thought yeah. a nice idea would be if Josh plays Juliet, you know, a sort of Mark Rylance style, Jonah, you can be Romeo. Love that. Love well, guys, we've so been, but... <laughs> time already. We've loved having you. This has been our first time in 18 shows having two people together. And oh, great. It's just fizzing of two <laughs> friends. What do we call you? Friends, rivals, lovers, all sorts, whatever. All, all of them. All, all of, of it. Them. So we're very yeah. grateful. Thank you. We have one very stupid game, which will last 30 seconds, which is this. And I don't know if Josh got the memo on this. If not, you'll... Josh, did you get a biscuit? I've got a biscuit. I would I've give got one. You... Hang on. Okay. Oh, is that good? I've got this biscuit. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I've been keeping this with a rectangle in a while. Oh my god. You've got oh, a man. perfect biscuit, perfect. Normally the hobnob is the one that really sticks to the forehead, but I think that's good. Our leaderboard says we have uh, Alex Wright, who uh, founded Dashwater. He's in the lead. Five and a half seconds with a hobnob. We've had Alfie Enoch with 26 seconds. Any other actors? No, we had Seb Fort, Louis Hines on 23. Uh, who else? We had Bash Croft on 13, so he's the actor to beat. Let's see how you guys do. I'm going to time. I've got my. So, how does it work? How does it work? Basically, you just got to get your biscuit from your forehead to your mouth yeah. Yeah. without using your hands. As quickly okay. as possible. A bit like the After 8 game, but for kids. And okay. no, Josh has lost already. Be no speed at the top. Speed at the top is going to kill you. You want to really gently nestle it down there to the mouth. Okay. <laughs> as All quickly right. as you can. So that kids out there can say, Eric and Prince Charles have been smashed at Biscuit Face live. Oh, wait. What is it? Okay, okay you ready? Okay, Second let's go. Starts now. <laughs> no. You can carry on. <laughs> what do I do now? Do it again. Have another go with the half. You can have a go. It's, it's pretty hard. If you look at this, oh, oh, Jonah's doing well. Jonah's got patience. There we go. He's doing really well. That's it. Massage it in there. Oh, I've lost the headphone. Yeah, he's done it. He's done it. Twenty-eight seconds. 
Josh didn't use his ears. Josh, I'm afraid you've been beaten. That's it. Life's over. How did he do it? How did Jonah manage it? Very carefully dropped his biscuits, broke in half. It was. That it was, was a move. move. That was a move. I wonder whether Prince Charles did biscuit face. He probably didn't, did he? Almost certainly did. You Almost. May, certainly, yeah. You may have done. Yeah. I reckon he played the after eight on that first date with Camilla, and you guys just didn't use it on the show. <laughs> can, I ask, can I ask? Can I ask one favour as we have you? So for context, Jonah and Josh, we're a mentoring business. We set up this as a, as, a, as a business to basically promote the idea that kids need mentors, adults need mentors. Uh, it's a great aspect of their, of their upbringing. Um, can I ask you to give me one line on the importance of mentoring before we go? I know that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of serious end to the interview, perhaps, but a line on whether you had a mentor and, and why mentoring is important. Um, I think mentoring is important because as we discussed in acting and in any job and in any life, um, you have lots of ups and downs and having someone there who is more experienced than you and um, maybe a little bit wiser than you uh, to help you to pick you back up, I think is a very um, important thing. Yeah, I think especially in our profession, but in most professions, it's kind of to someone who's been there and experienced everything before and also you know just as a kind of just in life i think um someone who's just kind of able you're someone you can talk to about the kind of the lows and all the highs and all that stuff basically what james I, su I suppose in a way i you must think of me as a bit of a mentor figure in a way absolute nonsense Nick, would you say so or i'm the older i could just leave the call if you like we can leave you guys too <laughs> <laughs> oh these are going on all night <laughs> we won't be a webinar we'll lock everyone else out. <laughs> we're really grateful for you giving us your time thank you so much well, thanks, thanks for having us it's an interesting time in the months to come for actors and we wish you every success we can't wait to see you guys back on set on our screens on our theaters and it's been hugely, hugely inspiring talking to two of you with such great success stories. So thank you both. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Take Have care. One. See you. Bye, guys.